there, I'm Chris Stash. I'm Mike White. And this is Father Malone. And we are the hosts of Dreams for Sale, the one and only podcast looking at the Twilight Zone 1985. On this episode, we're going to be talking about episode 13 of the show, which is broken into three segments, Night of the Meek, But Can She Type, and The Star. So this episode aired December 20th, 1985. It is ostensibly the first season of the show's Christmas episode. And the first segment, Night of the Meek, is a remake of the original episode, also titled The Night of the Meek, from the original run of the show. That episode had Art Carney in it, and it is uh, very similar in tone and structure to this episode. This episode, however, is written by Rockney O'Bannon, adapted from the original story by Rod Serling, and it stars everyone's favorite lovable asshole, William Atherton, and Richard Mulligan, from a sitcom that I am way too young to have any idea about. Oh, I sure watched a lot of soap. <laughs> yeah, me too. But uh, Richard Mulligan replaces the Art Carney character from the original episode, which is a man, a down-on-his-luck mall Santa who ends up becoming real Santa for an evening. And then for life, apparently, because that's the way this episode airs. Forever. <laughs> you didn't even have to push anybody off of a roof. Isn't that weird? <laughs> so what did you guys think of this segment? I was happy to see Richard Mulligan. I always liked him as Bert on Soap, and uh, we should make sure that people do not confuse him for the captain on the Police Squad movies, even though there is a little bit of a similarity between the two guys. And or, then, yeah, <laughs> I was going to say, or confuse him for Donald Moffat from The Thing, who actually happens to be in an episode of the show of on this episode. Because that's who I thought he was for, like, the first couple minutes. I was like, that's a guy from The Thing. Oh, wait, no, it's not. And then when Donald Moffat shows up later in the episode, I was like, no, that's the guy from The Thing. Holy shit. (laughs) And the guy from The Reanimator. Holy cow. Is that not the guy from Reanimator? Oh, is it? No, that's not David Gale. That was Fritz Weaver. Yeah, I thought Fritz Weaver was in, uh, wasn't he in one of those, the Reanimator films? No. No, man, he's in Creepshow. He's not in Reanimator. David Gale Um, is the, uh... Is, uh, Jesus the, the Christ. Professor but guess what? I totally thought the same thing. Wow. <laughs> so, yeah, so lots of uh, lots of uh, misidentification. Yeah. However, Good Lord. this episode however, was out to confuse us. I, I will tell you, uh, I liked this segment a lot. Yeah, it wasn't bad. As did I. I. Mean, it was pretty predictable. I was just like, okay, yeah, at some point, Atherton's going to show up, and he's going to fuck stuff up, and then, oh, there's going to be the, uh, the fur coat is going to be in the bag. Blah, 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 blah. So I was like, okay, I see every turn before it happens. And this is without necessarily being that familiar with the Art Carney one. But, I mean, it was it worked. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's standing in contrast to the last episode we watched, there's a way to do heartfelt without being schmaltzy. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think this kind of achieved that. I think Rocky, Rock Neo Bannon's script is actually uh, superior in every way to uh, Alan Brennard's take on her Pilgrim soul. Um uh, yeah, I, I, you know, I, I found this episode to be kind of rousing, uh, and uh, the, you know, uh, actually, I believe it to be an improvement on the Rod Serling original. Um, I liked this one uh, a whole lot more. Um, the, 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 the big selling point with that original one was that they got Art Carney uh, uh-huh. to do the, uh, the, the Santa part, but I think Richard Mulligan is so much better than him here, uh, playing both. Uh, the sort of down and out drunkard. He doesn't like lean too heavily into that standard sort of vaudevillian take on what a drunk is, like we saw Robert Morris do earlier this season. Uh, I think he does well there. And then, you know, once the miracles start happening, uh, I think he remain- remains consistent uh, uh, as far as uh, his character. I-, I-, I don't know. I really like this episode a lot. I thought it was. Uh, as good a Christmas thing, uh, a happy Christmas idea uh, as the Twilight Zone could produce. And I'm not going to lie, it got a little dusty in the room at the end. I mean, it's, mm-hmm. you know, it's an effective heart string pulling moment there at the end when they're sitting on the stairs together. Yeah. It, this one fired on all cylinders. I thought it was very solid. Which is surprising because it feels like it could have really easily veered into saccharin. Just melancholy bullshit. Oh, yeah. And when you're dealing with Christmas, you already have that huge danger. I mean, you can go over the edge so quickly 
and just start relying on, oh, Christmas spirit, oh, it's the season of the holiday. But luckily, they they managed to stay away from that. They managed to keep it more grounded than that, than just having to rely on this being a Christmas thing. I mean, if I have a quibble with the episode, it's when he finally does turn into Santa in the end. I don't think we needed that. Um, it was uh, a little much. <laughs> a little much. Maybe a lot much. What about those the, incredible the, the, special the, effects, though, oh when my. he disappears? <laughs> you, sir, oh, are man. a liar. You are a charlatan. <laughs> you are a false prophet among men, sir. Those special effects are bad. Like <sighs> Star Trek TOS, man. <laughs> like, with Star Trek TOS without the charm. <laughs> just like, out of nowhere, he just dematerializes and goes up the chimney. Okay, sure. Yeah. Well, and it was weird, too, because he was like, I want to see how he goes up the chimney, and then I don't think those little sparkle dots go up the chimney, do they? They do. Oh, okay. They do, Ooh. actually, yeah. Thank goodness. It's like Mike TV. You Not a good addition to the episode. No. No, but it's, a, again, as I said, it's a quibble. Like, uh, I, I didn't need it, but I wasn't exactly angry yeah. or uh, <laughs> that it happened. Like, it, you know, it seemed appropriate, but at the same time... Not necessary. Yeah, I mean, the way to end it is you have him look in the mirror and pull on his beard and his mustache, and then it just cuts away to you hear something, William Atherton looking above the house, and you see him you see him watching him fly away. You don't need to see everything else. Like, And I think I would have been exactly. fine with it. Like, it's, it's too much. For once, it's showing too much. Yeah, I can see that. But let's talk about something that is uh, just really bad, <laughs> because... I, I genuinely don't know how anyone is going to have anything nice to say about this episode. Let's talk about, but can she type? Why do you get the woman who has everything but respect? Ask Karen Billings, recipient of a very unusual and definitely non-returnable present. Because this year for Christmas, Karen Billings received the Twilight Zone. I don't know, Chris. I really like this one. What? I'm sorry. Sorry to disappoint you, but I really thought this was kind of cute. I like the concept of it. What? Uh, I, I like the idea of somebody doing a, men, a mundane job suddenly becoming a superstar in right. some alternate reality. Yeah, I like, like that, that idea, too. That is clever and fun. The execution is bizarre. Well, well the, mean, the MacGuffin of this magic Xerox machine is a little bit uh, much. Mm-hmm. But I liked all the characters in here. I liked the boss was a real prick yeah i liked when she went to the other dimension and jonathan frake shows up i was just like oh my god look at, <laughs> <laughs> look at young jonathan frakes with the beard so good yeah but you have to do you have to do the um you have to know if is it fact or fiction <laughs> if this alien autopsy proves to be true it could i just be kept the biggest piece of fact in the history of our in the history of the world <laughs> I just kept waiting for him to sit on a chair all strange. <laughs> you mean swing his leg yeah. over the top of the chair? Yes, exactly. That's not strange. That's and the then Riker. I, that's the Riker maneuver, pull, I know. <laughs> pull down his top. Yeah. Right, twice. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> I, like, I like the idea, like Father Malone said, of what this is trying to say. But I think the like usage of a Xerox, just, like, it just feels weird. I mean, this was the era of those kind of things. No, I think yeah, about, sure. Yeah, I think about the word processor uh, in the one that Stephen the King gods. penned for um, Tales from the Dark Side, where if he deleted people's names, they actually disappeared from the world. So I was like, okay, yeah, it's it's a little, you know, goofy and everything, but I liked it. I liked that she went into this other dimension, that her car keys disappeared, and, you know, things were different. And yeah, the whole idea of like her being treated like this superstar because she was a secretary, I really got into that idea. And then I was so glad that she managed to go back to that world and just live in that forever and not have to worry about the shithole that she was working at. I guess going through like a lot of problems in my job right now, I just really wish that I was Pam Dauber or could be with Pam Dauber. I wish that I was Jonathan <laughs> You wish you were Jonathan Brakes' chair? That's right. Whoa. Throw his leg over me. That'd Ooh. be fantastic. Sit on your face. Uh-huh. Feel that beard. Oh. Yeah. Jonathan Brakes is a nice guy. Uh, I, 
And Pam Dauber was making me real thirsty. I was just really <laughs> digging her in this. I do like how Jonathan Frakes' his character is just referred to in the belly as single guy. Mm-hmm. The single guy, yeah. Single guy who wants to know if it's fact or fiction. <laughs> no need for names here. No. Now, uh, Chris, when we talked to Rock Me S. O'Bannon um, uh, about Shadow Man, we talked about uh, this episode, not this particular segment, but the, the Christmas episode as it was. And originally, uh, Harlan Ellison was going to make his directorial debut uh, with a segment called Knackles, which is sort of this anti-Santa Claus one. It was going to be the actual horrific episode or segment uh, of the piece. And then CBS, uh, their censors killed it like a month before they were going to start filming. And this is why Harlan Ellison left the show after this particular episode. So in its place, they put in this, and the only real Christmas... I mean, they mention it's Christmas Eve, and we can see a Christmas tree at one point, but that was their way of shoehorning this into their otherwise Christmas episode. Because the first and the second, or first and third episodes are definitely Christmas-based. Um, but uh, uh, I, I just thought it was funny, like, watching it, like, just seeing the Christmas tree in the background going, like, oh, okay, yeah, that's why they – that's why this is a quote-unquote Christmas episode. Yeah, I really had to look for that. And to the point where I, was, I had forgotten until you guys reminded me. I was oh, yeah, I guess there was a poinsettia in the background. Yeah, I mean, it's like a passing mention, like, and it's Christmas tomorrow. Okay. Yeah, I mean, you know, right. okay, sort of a Christmas episode. work on Christmas? Yeah. But uh, I think, uh, I, I think Mike, you might have swayed me in your direction. I, I, I liked the episode uh, just fine. I thought it was okay. But, uh, yeah, there's something sort of uh, charming about the, the mundane becoming uh, the, the spectacular. With that, the, like the, well, I'm a high, uh, uh, I'm a high-earning uh, supermodel, but really what I want to be is a secretary. <laughs> right. <laughs> I mean, again, I like so, the idea. I just feel like it's not much of an episode. Does that make sense? It's like it just feels it falls flat as a segment. Does that make sense? I don't know. Yeah, maybe, maybe yeah. Well, I, I, I am. I respect. I'm not a fan that. of the Xerox machine. Uh, well, there's just although I do like rules. the I it's do like, like the, the symbols. Transports her the end. Yeah, yeah pretty like she used it twice or something, and like maybe some different settings took her to another place i mean maybe make it like more central to the episode and then it's like why are these guys coming to take this thing away but yeah Yeah. and and is she the only one who can use it and and go to an alternate dimension right yeah maybe send that friend of her someplace else maybe send her boss someplace else because that guy's a dickhead Mm. yeah yeah that would have been nice yeah i wonder what they do to bad bosses in that dimension bad bosses don't exist apparently is kind of what it seems hmm or maybe they're run out on a rail, tarred and feathered. <laughs> just it was just it was just a little weird, but like at the same time, I guess like that's the universe she lives in now, and now she's like a big hotshot. So there you go. It's like she, it's almost like she found her way into the Twilight Zone. Yeah, permanently. I do like these episodes where it's like, and now you're in the Twilight Zone permanently. I I, I do appreciate that. Yeah, and it is a departure in that most Twilight Zone episodes, although, you know, not recently, uh, where the twist ends up being uh, horrific and uh, and damaging to the lead character. Here it's uh, somebody who is downbeat and downtrodden and gets what they deserve. Right. Uh, and I guess we got that with the, with, the, with the previous one as well. Well, let's talk about a, uh, a, a an interesting um, third segment. In what has been up until this point a very good episode, or middle of good to middle of the road episode, The Star. The survey ship Magellan, bearing with it the last legacy of a long dead people. A legacy to be kept and cherished, and in time bequeathed to a world still unborn from the current inhabitants of the Twilight Zone. So it is an adaption of an Arthur C. Clarke, one of the titans of sci-fi, his short story, The Star. It is adapted by Alan Brennert, so, you know, it, it, what? It, it's going to be good if he adapted it and didn't outright write it. It stars Fritz Weaver and Donald Moffat. Yes, Donald Moffat from The Thing, not uh, Richard Mulligan, who's not in The Thing. And uh, it, it focuses on Fritz Weaver, who is a father, as in of the church, and Donald Moffat, who is a doctor of the science, and uh, kind of a, 
<laughs> You're welcome. And it, it focuses on uh, kind of an, an interesting star that they come upon on Christmas in space. Christmas in space, y'all. Bet you can't figure out what's going to happen here. <laughs> uh, not I, telegraphed uh, at all. I no. did not pick on, up on that. Oh, okay. So Good, I, then it works. Am, am I a dumb? No, you're not a dumb. <laughs> am I a dumb? Am I a dumb? <laughs> no. I, I, but I'll tell you what, even though I didn't pick up on it, I really liked it. Yeah, this Ooh. one I wasn't as hot on. Just because... Didn't have Riker. <laughs> it's just two guys talking, and there were times where uh, these two guys look fairly different, but dressed up in their get-ups and stuff, there were times where I was confusing these two characters, and then when he called him father, I was just like, is that his dad? What is going on here? If <laughs> 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 it was his dad, he would have called him daddy, let's be honest. I, just, no, I, I, like, I like the idea. Thought that I, I really, I really like the father. idea. That they were like, uh, you know, this is our science officer, uh, this is our engineer, this is our navigator, and our Jesuit priest. <laughs> like, what? What is happening on this spaceship? It's a spaceship of value and of religion. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. And, and uh, you know, look, I, I actually do like the concepts of this episode, um, but the space outfits that they're wearing... Like, straight from Lost in Space? Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah, the space outfits are really boring. And, like, generically <laughs> conventional? <laughs> so shiny. Uh, Not good. The, really the bad. The they're wearing are real bad. Yeah, they look like something I could see in, like, Outer Mongolia, you know? Oh, they look like something. They look like something that your mom would make for you when you were a kid and you're an astronaut <laughs> for Halloween. <laughs> oh, boy. And, you know, I, I, I hate... Um, I mean, this isn't necessarily, like, uh, dialogue as exposition, but when we open on these two characters, they're having the sort of age-old science versus religion debate. And all I could think is, these two guys have been in space for God knows how long. They've not had this conversation yet. Well, not on camera. I mean... Right. (laughs) Right. You're welcome. (laughs) The thing that got me is that... (sighs) So it's this whole thing of like, hey, yeah, the civilization, they seem to be great. And then they died out and their star exploded. And then that ended up being the star that the Magi saw on the way to Bethlehem. And oh, yeah, so science kind of caused religion or whatever. And I'm just like, but hasn't Christianity caused nothing but problems since it was invented? So you're welcome. (laughs) Thank you, science. (laughs) Right. I'm just like, yeah, had had Christianity never happened, I think we would probably be in a much better place. I don't know. I, you know, and uh, what I liked about the episode was the notion that doesn't actually pay off. I mean, it kind of does, but then it gets tempered, where this Jesuit priest realizes that, you know, how many billions of people uh, ended up getting extinguished so this star could, uh, uh, you know... Uh, lead these people to or signify the birth of the savior on our world right Uh, but then like i like the idea that everything in his mind just completely shattered at that moment uh but then of course the science guy because we have to have this you know balance of science and religion like steps in is like it's okay because this and this and this you know like no how about just let leave this guy a broken man this would be very twilight zoney if he realized that like you know, the, the the birth of his savior signified the death of another billion. Like, that, to me, would have been an interesting end to the episode. Something, you know, a little bit more uh, macabre and sort of shocking. But it, it doesn't ever achieve that. It just kind of, like, stays level the whole time, where science and religion can go hand in hand. So right. here's the thing. My dad is a huge fan of Arthur C. Clarke. And I, when I was younger, my dad bought me, at Half Price Books, a bunch of Arthur C. Clarke books and being someone who reads a lot i read all of them and this story was included in one of those like collection of short stories the original short story ends the way you're talking about father malone oh wow where he's like oh my god no like what the fuck ever like the priest is all like just completely beside himself and like that's fantastic yeah that's how it should have ended well, I like that ending, but I do like the kind of poem they found 
in the episode in the cave. You know, it has a good message. I mean, look, in this three-part Christmas episode of Twilight Zone, they can't end it on a bummer. Like, Yeah, they should have. This is the Twilight Zone. This is the Twilight yeah, Zone. If you're yeah, going to end but, anything but, on a but, bummer. But, 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 but it's their fucking Christmas episode, guys. I would agree with right, you but we, any other episode. We've already... Uh, but, like, I feel like they can't send we, you off with that. Uh, well, then they should have started with this segment, because the two others are so thoughtful and uplifting, like, you needed a gut punch in there at some point. Maybe in the middle they could have put it. You know what? Okay. No. I'm that, Forget everything I'm saying. It should have ended this way, and it should have been shattering. Listen here, Jordan Peele. We get it. You want to be edgy. Oh, stop. No, 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 no. <laughs> We get it. You have a racial agenda. That would be if a billion <laughs> black people died in order to cause yeah, Christianity. Right. Yeah, that's uh, that. That would have been the Jordan Peele folks. episode. <laughs> the racial. You mean the star exploded and caused slavery? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you mean Adam Scott was on the plane the whole time with the podcast? Oh my god, my mind is blown. Oh, I am having flashbacks. <laughs> A million, a million Dan Carlins died so he could get one episode of Hardcore History. <laughs> oh, many Bothans died so you could have a savior in Christ. Oh, I fucking, yeah. Twilight Zone 2019 can go and fuck itself. But hey, we're getting it in 2020, so what the fuck do we know? Nothing. We're just three, we're just three cisgendered white men. Our opinions don't matter. Good place to end it. <laughs> <laughs> Except we can't end it there, unfortunately, as much as I want to. On the next episode of Twilight Zone 1985, aka Dreams for Sale, we're going to be taking a look at episode 14 of Twilight Zone 1985. That is broken into three segments once again Still Life, The Little People of Kalani Woods. Okay. And oh, I hope there's some leprechauns in that episode. <laughs> no, but there will be a oh, leprechaun you think? later in the season on the leprechaun artist. Oh, okay. At least, you know, they're keeping with the... Uh, I hope that's in March, so that we're keeping with the seasonal Twilight Zones. It's not. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Right? What a missed opportunity. And the yeah. third, the third uh, bit of <laughs> episode fun is The Misfortune Cookie, starring one of ah, my yes. favorites, Elliot Gould. That's right. Elliot Gould, he's great in that one. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. So until then, where can people find you, Father Malone? Uh, look over on YouTube and check out my show You've Never Seen on my channel, Odd 5 Films. Hey, if you have seen that movie that I'm describing, shut the fuck up. Uh, you can also hear me over on Chronicles <laughs> from the Crypt. That's Chris and, Chris and I do a podcast about the Tales from the Crypt television series. You can also hear me on Chris's podcast, CultureCast, at least once a month discussing uh, movies and, and, and such. <laughs> but are we the only people that can tell you we've seen the movies you're talking about? Yes, because you won't act like I'm fucking insane for suggesting that you haven't. Well, we won't act like you're insane for that reason. I mean, has well. my lawyer contacted you yet about the whole thing? <laughs> Yeah. You're cutting into our back end. For any any time I've seen one of the movies that I get a cut of the profit. Yeah. You, you do. Uh, you get a cut of zero because that's what YouTube gives me. <laughs> <laughs> like like Albert Fish, you're cutting into my back end. Right. <laughs> that's an awful joke. <laughs> that Don't is a terrible it, joke. For fuck's sake. Uh, where can people find you, Mike White? Sometimes I go on the culture cast. Sometimes I speak about movies with you, Chris. And then other times I'm over on the Barney Miller podcast, which is available at BarneyMillerPodcast.com. And What's it called? It's called The Life and Times of Barney Miller. It has a name now. It was just the Barney Miller podcast, but Chris said, you know, that's kind of dull. So we, we juiced it. I, li- I, I like it. Our, yeah. heads, our heads are now inflated due to steroid use. <laughs> <laughs> And then uh, every once in a while I get some roid rage and I do a podcast called The Projection Booth, which you can find at projectionboothpodcast.com. It's just an hour and a half of you screaming. I scream <laughs> and I play Metallica and I get pumped up and I slam my hands on the fi- uh, on the sink and stuff. It's Jesus fantastic. Christ. Excuse yeah. me, Chris. It's a six-hour podcast of him <laughs> doing that. I can only get so erect. Fuck. Brams are toast. <laughs> yep. Uh, as for myself, you can find me on the Culture Cast like these two guys mentioned. You can also find me on the One Season Show with my friend Jess Byard, whose opinion on Duel is not incorrect. 
talking about incorrect (laughs) liar shows that only lasted one season as well as oh well you guys plugged everything else and Kolchak tapes doesn't exist anymore uh, Twilight Zone 85. I would like to. Find, <laughs> Twilight Zone 85 Chris, is where you'll find this on the internet. And Twilight Zone 85 is where you'll find us on Twitter. Big thanks always to Chris. Roxy Drive at. Wait. What? <laughs> I just want to discourage people from listening to the Culture Cast episode about Duel because it is way off. Yeah, well. Okay. Yeah, it's com- Continue. It's a misfire. It's probably one of the worst episodes I've ever Oh, before. my God. It's so <laughs> bad. In fact, if you, li- if you like things that are so bad that they're good, then listen to that episode of the Culture Cast. If you want to go fuck yourself, do so now. <laughs> <laughs> I don't need your permission to do that. <laughs> and as always. I've, I've got plenty. <laughs> I got plenty of YouTube commenters telling me that. (laughs) And as always, big thanks to Roxy Drive and Neutron Dreams for the music for Dreams for Sale. We'll catch you on the next episode. 